I'm 360 meters above the streets of Manhattan, climbing up the side of an actual skyscraper. The winds up here can get pretty extreme, which don't just make the climb more exciting, but also pose a unique set of engineering challenges. When solved correctly, they result in some of our most iconic buildings. When not, well, there's one we'll be visiting later, which almost got blown over. One of the first things you'll notice when entering New York is that it is an incredibly blustery place. Almost like the city is somehow magnifying wind speed. To find how much that's true, I've brought with me this ammeter, or wind speed gauge, in order to get some measurements from around the city. At the moment, it's about 0.5 meters per second. Not particularly high, but let's see what it's like in other locations. The regions around waterways and Central Park had the lowest wind speeds, with the highest around Midtown and the Financial District. The region between was a bit more sedate. If we change our perspective, we see that high wind speeds correlate with a high density of skyscrapers. That's because of something known as the Street Canyon Effect, where tall buildings redirect wind onto the street. This effect is compounded by New York's gridded layout, which acts to channel in and accelerate winds flowing parallel to the road. Conversely, meandering routes, smaller buildings, and trees impede the wind's flow, which is what gave the low-rise regions and Central Park comparatively sedate speeds. Another factor to consider, especially relevant for skyscrapers, is that wind speed increases the higher up you go. That's because there is less friction with the ground. Up at the top of the rock, wind speeds are a couple of meters per second, while down at Rockefeller Plaza, it was more like one. With these effects combined, a rough calculation shows us that during a storm, the Empire State Building should be experiencing some 20 million newtons of horizontal wind loading, roughly equivalent to hanging nine Statues of Liberty off the side. To find out what sort of effect that this wind loading has on structural stability, and to find some methods to overcome it, I've come to Central Park with a few miniature skyscraper models and an electric leaf blower. Our first model takes the form of an aggressively box-like tower that wouldn't look out of place on the engineering campus of any major university. This is going to be a control, a skyscraper without any form of wind mitigation. The structure oscillates back and forth. Our residents will not be having a good time. I first thought that this wobble was caused by variations in wind speed and direction, but I have a leaf blower that is fixed in position, so it's got to be caused by something a bit more complicated. To find out what, I ran some simulations. Here is a model I made in SolidWorks, which, yes, in retrospect, I realized probably wasn't the right tool for the job, but it's what I had at hand. Here we have a horizontal 2D cross-section of a skyscraper with wind flowing from left to right. These arrows indicate the air's velocity, but to better highlight structure, let's switch to vorticity, which essentially tells us if the air is spinning clockwise, counterclockwise, or if it's stationary. The fluid's inertia causes it to detach from behind the skyscraper. This creates a low pressure region directly behind the obstacle. Nature hates this imbalance, and eventually, almost like magic, you can see these vortices forming as first one side and then the other gets sucked in and blown away. This makes the pressure field oscillate as well, generating a force which makes the building sway. Older skyscrapers like the Empire State and Chrysler buildings overcome these effects by building really strong, really sturdy structures, which are less likely to be able to flex in the wind by nature of them being really heavy. That's equivalent to replacing a paper skyscraper with one made out of cardboard. While our second model still wobbles, it does so to a much lesser extent. Unfortunately, building in this way is extremely expensive and woefully wasteful, so today, other approaches are used. Moving down the line, the next option is just to put a really big hole through your skyscraper. This reduces the wind loading, and therefore reduces wobble. You can also adapt it to suit a few different architectural needs. The Shanghai World Financial Center has one such hole, as do these high-rise apartments in Hong Kong. While some attempts have been made to incorporate wind turbines into these holes, their success is rather limited. Those in London Strata SE1 rarely spin. Back in New York, 432 Park Avenue uses these wind hole features to exploit a loophole in New York's zoning laws. 
Floors reserved for structural and mechanical equipment don't count against a building's maximum size. As of recording, it is the world's third tallest residential building, in no small part due to these five windbreaks, which artificially elongate the structure. Similar wind benefits can be derived by giving the upper floors a tapered design, as seen in the One World Trade Center, 53 West 53, and 30 Hudson Yards. If we change the shape of our building, we can prevent vortex shedding before it really starts. This significantly cuts back on vibration. One way of doing this is including cutbacks on the design, as we have here, although there are various other iterations, including spirals and different setbacks, which have a very similar effect. Running the simulation again, you can see that while some vortex structures still form, they are much less defined. The pressure field also confirms that oscillating forces are significantly reduced. Combining and playing off of these techniques is the job of engineers and architects. But when things go too far, we risk the lives of the very people that these buildings were designed to hold. This is 601 Lexington Avenue, or at least part of it. As it turns out, filming a skyscraper from ground level turns out to be rather challenging. Fortunately though, most of the interesting stuff is down here at ground level. Back when the land was purchased in 1968, it was done so under condition that they wouldn't be interfering with St. Peter's Church, which still resides in a corner of the property. These constraints gave lead engineer Wooden de Mussier a unique engineering challenge. After a day spent professoring at MIT, he was having dinner at a Greek restaurant just off campus. Doodling on a napkin, he surveyed his options. Le Mussier's first idea was to design the skyscraper like a table with forces transferred horizontally and then down through four corner columns. Unfortunately, this just wasn't going to work with a church in the way, so he moved the columns toward the center. Unfortunately, this meant that the floors were no longer supported and would just collapse. This problem hadn't been faced before with skyscraper design, but trees have been doing something very similar for millions of years, as they support their canopy. His idea was to use some branch-like diagonals to transfer forces toward a central trunk-like column. Unfortunately, this design was now quite unstable, so to reduce building wobble, he added in a tuned mass damper, recently invented by one of his colleagues. It was undoing repairs while I was in New York, but here is a video of it back in 2015 during a storm. Located near the apex of the tower, a large concrete mass is supported on some electronically controlled springs. This helps to absorb the building wobble, keeping the entire thing stable. Upgrading his design from a napkin doodle into something slightly more professional, he submitted his proposal, and in April of 1974, work began on the skyscraper. Upon its completion, 601 Lexington Avenue was heralded for its unique design. However, soon concerns were raised internally about the building's structural integrity. During fabrication, the conventional wisdom had been that diagonal wind forces on a skyscraper were negligible. Appropriately, 601 had been designed with only the sideways winds taken into account. However, what the original engineers hadn't realized is that 601's novel branch structure would result in diagonal wind loads being carried unevenly, doubling the stress in some of the beams while dropping it to zero for the others. Talking with a student about his interesting design, Le Mussier was suddenly hit with a realization. He hadn't taken into account diagonal wind loading, and that was going to be a problem. Updating his calculations, Le Mussier realized that if power to the tuned mass damper were lost during a storm, and if those storm winds were particularly significant, then the resulting sway would cause the doubly stressed branches to fail and the entire structure would come crashing down. Such an event was expected to occur roughly once every 16 years. With hurricane season fast approaching, something had to be done. Le Mussier put together a team of welders working late at night so as to avoid panicking the civilian population. After two nail-biting months, the weaker bolted sections were retrofitted with welded supports and the structure was deemed safe. In a final twist, it appears that these frantic retrofits may not have been entirely required. Applying modern wind simulation tools, it appears that the loads would not have actually been significant enough to break the beams. 
However, since there was no way of knowing this at the time, I think Lemassier made the right choice. New York is a city that hasn't just defined Skyscraper as a really tall building, but also as an art form shaped by the wind. Next time you're walking along the blustery streets of your local city, make sure to keep looking up. This has been James Dingley from the Atomic Frontier.